stop messing around, stop fooling around, stop delaying, stop procrastinating. Get up, get out, get it done. Everything is possible, nothing is a problem, and anything can be overcome. I just get my ass up out of bed, I get my shit together, and I get out and I start the fight. And that will transform you from uh, a mere mortal into a superhuman being. I've never, ever, ever met anybody who told me that they got rich watching their IRA or their 401k. All right, Peter, I want to talk about communication breakdown. Well, I, yes, go ahead. Well, I'm just like jumping in. Yeah, well, how we No, like, up? hello, how are you? <laughs> Did you stay up all night watching the election results? Did you stay up all night watching the election I results? stayed up for a little yeah. while yeah. watching them, and I was uh, texting around with my various people on the ground in different areas to see if the results were in. And Yeah. I, you know, I, I like to watch the results of races come in. Yeah. I feel like in in this particular election, it, this feels more important than many other elections. We say that every year. We do. This is the most important election ever. Totally. And, but, but I do, it's all often talked about with the presidential election. And I often feel like that's overblown. Not that that's not important, but I think the local elections, a lot of times are where a lot of the policies are really implemented most heavily. And so I feel like these are actually the important elections and it's actually getting the attention that it deserves. I think this time around. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so interesting to watch what all of this says about us as a society Mm. and what's important to us. And, you know, this year it's the inflation and abortion and immigration and things like that uh, are the main ones that have been on voters' minds. And it's it's so interesting to me to watch the ebb and flow of these issues sort Mm. of rise and fall as other issues take priority. So, like, you know, abortion's a huge one. Inflation's huge. And so stuff that we would normally care about maybe in previous years it didn't really come up this year in terms of top things that are on voters minds and it's it's because they get eclipsed by the new issue of the day so to speak and it's for me it's interesting to watch that happen yeah Uh, i think that's been a challenge with as with the internet and social media and access to more information um we only have so much bandwidth as individuals as to what we can care about and what we can pay attention to and so yeah it's, you always see okay this is the thing that's capturing the you know the zeitgeist of the era kind of yeah thing, but. i've talked to friends and family and i said you know how do you guys vote do you do you just vote on the party line on everything or do you look at the candidates and the issues and it doesn't matter if they're blue or red you just choose who's yeah. the better person for the job like how does it work and most people I talk to say it doesn't matter. They just vote right down the, the party line. And really? Yeah. Huh. yeah. I find it less and less frequent to speak to someone that will vote according to their opinion on how the candidate is mm. suited for the job. It's so interesting to me. I'm a person that votes according to the suitability of the candidate for the job yeah. and issue by issue. I, there's people in my family, people in my close circle that are one issue voters. They mm-hmm. don't care about anything else. Uh, for example, abortion, that's the only thing they care about. And they'll vote for whatever the most pro-abortion right candidate, mm-hmm. uh, whoever that may be. I mean, yeah, yeah. obviously it's a blue ticket yeah. person yeah. Right now all the least. time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But it's so interesting. I recall the James Carville quote every time it's election season. It's the economy, stupid. Mm. That's the main thing I think about. And I saw that during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, when people couldn't get to the gas pumps and they needed to get their to their uh, work so they could earn their paycheck and get the money. Like, yeah. we need money. There needs to be an economy. I feel like there's uh, a real disregard for the health of the economy and for uh, business rational decisions being made by our civic leaders as they relate to the economy. Because in today's world, there's so many important issues going on that are on people's minds that the economic issues, I think, lately have taken a back seat in terms of importance for the individual voter. That's what I I sense in my travels. Yeah, well, I think it, it takes a little bit more work to attach economic plight to uh, a human story, I think. And, mm. and, and I think th- that is a real thing, but I think it takes just a little bit extra work. And so as a result, storytellers in our culture tend to not go through that work. These elections tell us a lot about our community and our society and who we are as people and what's important to us. Obviously, they tell us those things. Yeah. And I'm someone that indexes very strongly towards economic issues because I believe that the cash register has to ring first. And then after that, you can solve whatever problems you want. But mm. without there being a budget there, without there being money there to throw at things, then you can't really do much. So I tend to be one that 
that is highly impacted by economic issues because I feel like if I have money, I can do good with it. Mm -hmm. If I don't have money, all I'm doing is kicking and screaming with no ability to really make a change, I think. Yeah, we talked about this with uh, the Houston Housing First movement about that when somebody's drowning, you don't say, well, I'll save you as long as you go to this class or as long as you, you know, promise to do this X, Y, and Z. Housing you, first. Yeah, you, 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 you save them from drowning first and then you can teach them how to swim afterwards. You're saying a similar thing with the economy. that you So know, interesting. Yeah, you have to stop the bleeding first yeah. before you can, you know, uh, triage after that. Yeah. It's surprising and disappointing to hear you say that the people that you asked voted just party line. Uh, party line and, voters. And, and I have to admit, I, I voted heavily in one party this election. However, the night before, my wife and I, well, we pretty much do this every election, where we do kind of like a study party almost where you, you, know, you search the candidate, you find you know, issues, find the articles, find the things that they've been talking about and things like that. And uh, that's always been a habit of mine for all the elections that I've been you know, able to vote in. And uh, yeah, it's disappointing. that I'm Perhaps right. that's new, unique these days. I guess. Yeah, that's disappointing. I would think that most people just vote party line. Like if you're on the red team, you're just voting red. Doesn't matter who it is. Doesn't yeah. matter what it is. Yeah. And vice versa. Wild stuff. We'll see how it plays out. Yeah. It's crazy stuff. No, a lot of new stuff. So yeah, so I did want to talk about communication breakdown I the election conversation. Um, I don't want to break down communication. <laughs> I want to increase communication. Yeah. What, what do you mean by communication so, breakdown? So yeah, so the Daily Princetonian reported... Oh, the, yeah. the bastion I know, of... Right. <laughs> Uh, right. <laughs> the New York Times, it's the Wall Street Journal, New York Times and Daily Princetonian. You know, they're the publication near and dear to my heart yeah. because I you spend a lot of time know a lot about yeah. Princeton. Yeah. We'll just put it that I way. Have a lot of family and friends there. They and reported business. that, yeah, that Princeton University uh, implemented this no communication order policy or changed it um, that essentially the policy requires two parties to employ informal conflict resolution. Like staff? Uh, no, like students. I, I imagine it applies to staff as well, though. Work the thing out amongst okay. themselves before they apply for this thing called an NCO, which it seems to be an academic version of a restraining order, essentially. Um, academic version of a restraining yeah, so, order. So like if, if, if you formally apply for this NCO, you can no longer speak to this person. You can't be in the lunch line with them. You oh can't be God. in a classroom with them. You have to just avoid all Why does there have to be a thing called an NCO? I, look, yeah. I agree and fully support an institution like Princeton or really anybody else saying, hey, look, you two people work it out amongst yourselves. Don't involve us. Don't bother us. Yeah. You're, you're here to learn or you're here to work or whatever the, the deal is where you are, but yeah. you guys work it out amongst yourselves. Like, I get that. But now they're saying, do that first and then you can apply for the restraining order? Yeah, so I think this was in response to uh, Daniel Shapiro was a reporter for... I, I think, know, yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. I know that story very well. Yeah, so I think that occurred and that, that interaction that she had with um, another student occurred where she thought she had figured out a resolution to the conflict or had interacted with this person in an amicable way. And then this NCO was filed against her. And you can file an NCO against someone like, I don't like you. I'm going to file this against you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so Princeton now has made this change of saying, before you do that, you have to try and talk to the person first. I guess I'm baffled by an NCO. Have institutions, have schools been using things like NCOs for a, a long time? Because I'm, I'm not aware. Yeah, this is the first time I'm hearing it reported about, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was somewhat common, especially in Ivy League situations. I feel well, like. yeah. uh, listen, I mean, in the, in the world of triggering and safe spaces and you're trespassing in my safe space and all of this stuff, it would make sense that if you subscribed all the, that other stuff that you would also subscribe to a restraining order or an NCO. When I grew up, if I didn't like you, I just didn't talk to you. Or if I didn't want you to talk to me and you kept talking to me, I'd punch you in the face once mm-hmm. after school and then you'd never talk to me again. Like I, I'm, it's, it's, a, it's yeah. a crazy world, but I'm open to the fact that I've aged out of the generation where this new stuff is going on. And so if this is the way the world is today, I... Yeah, I think I'm, I'm interested in man. that this is making news at all in the sense well, that I think the communication component, this seems like it should be obvious that, yeah... And this is a university. It's a place of teaching. What yeah. are we teaching people? Right. Yeah, I, I feel like it should be obvious that you would want to communicate with someone first on in an informal way before you escalate to some kind of semi-legal situation. George, I'll tell you what, when you get out of college and you go work at a company or wherever it is you're going to be working at, mm-hmm. 
Like, if you don't like someone, you can't go file an NCO against, like, it doesn't exist in the real world. So why does it exist in the pre-real world? I, I don't get why they're making that even something that's available. Because when you go work for McKinsey, you Princetonites, you're, you you got to deal with people. Yeah. Different personalities, different agendas, different beliefs. You have to, like, it all has to work. You have to make it work. Yeah. And making it work is not being like, uh I'm canceling or whatever. That's I'm using my words, but you can't be like, oh, I'm going to file an NCO against you. Like I, I don't even know what that is. So that it sounds, it's foreign to me. Mm-hmm. It sounds foreign to me. I don't get it. I definitely get the university saying you guys work it out am- amongst yourselves. Don't bother us with it. But I don't get that there's even the existence of an NCO, an academic restraining order. <laughs> yeah. Don't talk to me. I don't like you. I don't want you to talk to me. Like. I, I don't, are, are people not capable of just accomplishing that on their own without filing and making a complaint on written, documented in a system for? Yeah, I think it's path of least resistance. I'm kind baffled, of man. Yeah, I'm yeah, baffled. Yeah. It does. It did remind me of uh, we did a piece. I think this was like a year, maybe two years ago, about your like your lease and like I think you called it a good neighbor clause. Oh, we that. have that. Well, well, yeah. we had we work it out amongst yourselves. Don't call us. We are not in the business of governing the relationship between neighbors. Yeah. I don't think universities are in the business of governing the relationship between their students. Yeah. If students don't like one another, like in the real world, they just don't relate. Right. right? They don't talk to each yeah. other. They don't like they, they just work it out. Yeah. I, I don't get why the university has to even take a position and have a policy and have a a tool such as an NCO it seems yeah. very, very foreign to me. And I think it's pandering to a, a certain portion of their student body population, which for lack of a better word, George, I'm just going to call weak and unprepared and lacking of communication skills. Well, and certainly if this was a community college or, you know, an underf- underfunded university, I could maybe understand if uh, they just didn't want to deal with the problem. But considering it's Princeton University, you would think maybe instead of an NCO, they would have some kind of communication mediation process that would be like, this is how you communicate. This is how you resolve conflict. It's still a little bit handholdy, but it, you would think there would be something like that as opposed to, well, we're just going to opt out for all communication. Are there life. guidelines as to when and how you can file for an NCO? Like what kind con- constitutes a violation of communication between students. From the article that I read, it seemed that you could file it for pretty much no reason. No reason. Yeah, yeah. I just don't like you. Yeah. I'm pissed at you. I'm jealous of you. Um, whatever with yeah. you. And so I'm just going to file something against you. Yeah. This is not the world I grew up in, I fully admit. So for those of you out there who feel like you can set me straight with this, please leave comments and tell me what it is I'm missing. But this seems completely ridiculous to me. And I think it's a horrible path to go down. And I think it's the wrong thing to be teaching people at the college level uh, that there are tools out there available to if you don't like someone or if you disagree with someone, you just file something against them. You know what you do if you don't like or disagree with someone? Just avoid them. Just cut them out of your life like you would a bad ex or a spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, any sort of friend, whatever. Just cut them out. Like, I don't know why we can't do that at Princeton University. Seems bananas to me. They, they did go on to say you, sexual allegations, obviously, are a separate issue. That's a, well, that's that's a different. That's different. Yeah, no, it's Can a, we just recognize I, that I'm not being, like, uh, deaf to that? I, 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 absolutely. I, but I did want to acknowledge that. that yeah. they, they also acknowledge that, that that is a separate issue. Um, Physical assault, right. sexual assault, yeah. any, anything... That's major yeah, stuff. Yeah, but when it comes to simply disagree, you know, verbally disagreeing with I don't someone, like your policies. I don't like the words that are coming out of your mouth. I yeah. don't like what you stand for or what I think you stand for. So I'm going to file something yeah. against you. And then, and then what happens when you file something against someone? Does that like become a part of the record? Is that like an Oprah Bull document? <laughs> right, you know, that's, like, that's is true. I don't know. Like, yeah. is that so, like, it's so weird to me. Yeah. Man, people learn how to communicate with others. Mm. Get a little tough. Get a thick skin. Learn how to bounce and roll with the world on a day-to-day basis. If you don't like something, go a different direction. Avoid it. Don't continue to engage and don't cancel and don't, f- oh my God, file file complaints and like, listen, someone really wrongs you sexually, physically, mm-hmm. whatever the case, bullying, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I get it. People, what I'm trying to say is grow up, grow a pair, get some thick skin and stop with all the whining and the filing of complaints. And I mean, that's what this sounds like yeah, to me. Yeah. Work it out. And an entire lack of empathy, I think, in my mind. Like, you know, if you don't like someone or you, you do disagree with someone, maybe be curious instead of, you know, judgmental and try and, you know, figure out what they're, where they're coming from. Unbelievable, you know, man. So. I saw an article this week that mentioned assumable debt. 
it mentioned that uh, multifamily investors are pursuing this thing called assumable debt. Okay. As usual, this is a concept that was foreign to me. Hmm. <laughs> and so I was wondering, what is assumable debt? Why is it desirable for multifamily investors right now? Assumable debt is existing debt that can be assumed by a new owner of the asset or the building. Mm, got it. If you're a buyer, I'm a seller, and I have a mortgage on the building, and it's an assumable mortgage, assumable debt, I can sell you the building, and you can assume, step into my shoes as if you're the borrower now, because you will be the borrower, yeah. and just take over that existing debt until it expires according to the, the terms and conditions under the mortgage note that's in place today. Mm. People like that because debt that was put on buildings the first half of this year and, and earlier mm-hmm. was high twos, low threes, high threes, 4%, yeah. right? Now, if you were to go out into the marketplace and source debt for a multifamily acquisition, you'd be paying uh, 6.5%. Yeah. So, of course, as a buyer, I'd be far more interested in being able to buy your building with debt that's already on the books that's at 3.5% than at 6.5%, which is what I would get today if I had to shop it. The same is what's chilling the housing market, George. Sellers are reluctant to sell because if they sell, they have to then go back out to the market and get a mortgage for those who are using mortgages at a way higher rate. Right. A lot of people yeah, have... Definitely. 3% mortgages on their house. And if they went out today to go get a mortgage, they'd be paying 7%. Yeah. So that's stopping them from selling their house and then being buyers in a new market for a new product. Same with multifamily and commercial real estate. Assumable debt is debt that a new buyer can take over and assume. They don't have to go get a whole new mortgage at today's pricing. They can assume your mortgage at yesterday's pricing. It's very attractive in those cases where it exists. As a buyer, you have to know where the assumable debt is, what sellers have assumable debt. Mm-hmm. So it comes up in conversation. Hey, Bob, are you selling your building? Yes. Mm-hmm. Great. Do you have a mortgage on it? Yes. Is the mortgage assumable, Bob? Because if it is, we got a deal. Like that kind of thing. Right. So you have to really have a conversation with your counterpart and find out where there is opportunity to assume debt that's already on the the books yeah. from uh, a previous time period at a lower price. But if you can find those opportunities, it can make it a lot easier for you to close the transaction and to buy property right now. The commercial multifamily markets have come to just about a screeching halt. Yeah. New transaction volume is, it's like dust in the wind, man. All they are is dust in the wind. The reason why there's no transaction volume is because the price of debt is so high mm-hmm. that it creates a negative leverage situation and buyers can't justify investing when there's negative leverage. So it's it's a crazy, very specific set of market conditions that are current right now yeah. and in place right now. And it's caused the markets to come to a screeching halt. Is it municipal regulation that uh, determines whether or not something is assumable or not? Where oh, no, no, no. That, that, that's, that's contract? Or, assumability yeah. of a debt comes from your mortgage note and your mortgage terms from your lender. Okay, it has nothing that. to do with right. government or, yeah. or regulations or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, some, as you know, all mortgages are banking products mm-hmm. and some products are different than others. And so if you have a mortgage note on your building and it's assumable, it was negotiated at the time when you were seeking quotes and pricing from your lender back when you got that mortgage. Got it. So typically for a price, a new buyer can step in and assume that loan. The bank has to approve it, not to be unreasonably withheld, hopefully. Yeah. Those are the terms of the assumability yeah. clause. But a buyer has to be approved by the bank. The bank has to underwrite the buyer because that buyer is going to be the bank's new borrower. Right. The bank's only going to approve the assumable loan going to the new guy if the new guy is of a certain means, has a certain net worth, has a certain amount of liquidity, and can meet all the normal requirements of a borrower that any borrower has to have. Yeah. And, and they'll usually charge a half a point to a point for assumability for their time and effort to go ahead and process a new borrower and underwrite them and do credit checks and all of that stuff. Now, we're getting mortgages today that are not assumable. Banks are starting to, to cease offering assumability as a, as a feature of their right. loans. Yeah. So uh, you really have to ask the right questions and figure out if the building you're going after has existing debt and if that debt is, in fact, assumable. If it is, it may make it a whole lot easier for you to get it. We've talked about debt service coverage ratio. We talked about loan to value. One thing 
I haven't heard us talk about and something that I've been hearing a lot about recently is negative leverage. You just heard me say it five seconds ago. Did you say it? I said it five, ten seconds ago. Wow. Flashback. It creates a negative leverage situation. And negative leverage. Negative leverage. End of flashback. I guess so focused on myself that I didn't hear you. Uh, talk about communication breakdown. Um, so yeah, so negative leverage in response to the rising interest rates. What is negative leverage? Can you fill me so in? Negative leverage is what exists when the cost of borrowing exceeds the cash flow that you get from the building or the asset. Okay. So uh, that's a bad thing. You want to avoid that. <laughs> yeah. And we have that right now. Because right. right now, whatever very little transaction volume is occurring in multifamily is occurring at, I'm going to pick a cap rate, a six cap mm-hmm. or a six and a half cap or a high fives cap. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. So what we have right now is the cost of debt at six and a half or seven percent exceeds the cap rate, the rate of return that the building or asset is throwing off in today's market with whatever transaction mm-hmm. volume there is occurring. It's like six, yeah. five, five and change, six, six and a quarter percent for whatever's transacting. So you have an asset that throws off a return of say 6%, but you have to borrow at an interest rate of six and a half or seven percent. That's negative leverage. Mm-hmm. You don't want to borrow when the interest rate exceeds the amount of return that the asset throws off. You want to borrow when the interest rate is less than the amount of return that the asset throws off. So you want your asset throwing off six, seven percent, and you want to be borrowing at three and a half, four and a half percent. That's so, the way to do it. So if you were borrowing at, at that with negative leverage, is the hope that then you can refinance later on? Because well, that is a hope. Yeah, because otherwise it seems like. Well, but even why would, why even would you do the deal in, well, in the first place. Sure. Yeah. So you're yeah. not borrowing a hundred percent of the money at negative leverage. Got you're it, got borrowing. It. 50 or 65 or 68 or maybe 70 percent of the money yep. at negative leverage so there's 30 percent of equity that's not leveraged at all yeah so that will factor into the recipe and perhaps you're ahead of the game once you factor in the equity that's not leveraged yep. I would say the bigger hope about refinancing out later mm-hmm. for me the bigger hope would be can I even make it to the point <laughs> right, until I refinance out later yeah. because if you are carrying a debt at negative leverage, you're cash flow negative, man. Yeah. You're cash flow negative. I'm not, I don't know about you, George, but I'm not in the business of owning cash flow negative investments. <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, yeah. so uh, negative leverage is a condition that exists in the market right now. And if you are forced to have a capital event and be a seller or a buyer or have to refinance right now, mm-hmm. it may be a reality for you. Right. And you may be forced to pull money out of your own pocket to buy down loan balances so that even with negative leverage, you can afford to carry your asset if you have to recapitalize it or refinance it. As cannabis becomes increasingly legal and available for many states, um, it still is illegal at a federal level. And I was reading the other day about New York City uh, property owners being concerned about that kind of gray area of whether or not their tenants can sell cannabis. And I know you've been... What's they, the concern? That they're going to sell it on, on a black market or that they're licensed? Yeah, into, I, th- I think a little bit of both. I think I've heard that some property owners are concerned that the tenant doesn't have a proper license. Although some people are yeah. also concerned that even legal dispensaries may come under scrutiny because of the federal illegality of it. I um, don't know what this article was and I don't yeah. know what New York City property owners are concerned about more than Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Colorado, or Oregon, Washington, like all the other states. Yeah. This is not a big deal, guys. Any commercial lease, you have to have language in your lease that mm-hmm. requires your tenant to be in full compliance with all local, state, and federal regulations at all times, no exceptions. Yeah. So if the property owner is concerned about the tenant doing anything that might be not in compliance, you have to enforce your lease. I, I have no concern about entering into a lease with a cannabis retailer or a cannabis operation, I'll put into the lease that they have to be fully licensed and insured and in compliance with all regulations. They have to send me proof of compliance Mm -hmm. on on a quarterly basis. I want to check up, make sure their licenses haven't been revoked. I want to check up and make sure that permits haven't expired. I mean, this is what you have to do as a commercial property owner. So I'm not really sure what the big deal is in New York City, but If you're worried about someone who's licensed for one thing and they're doing that activity in your space, but they're also doing other things that aren't part of the licensure, you have to manage through that. They're your tenant. You have to have a relationship. You have to know what they're doing and what they're not doing and if it's in compliance. If they're in compliance, leave them alone. Let them pay your rent. If they're not in compliance, enforce your rights as a property owner. Send notices. Get them to be in compliance. This is what owning property is. So I don't know what's going on in New York City, but if you have a concern about renting property to a a cannabis operator of any kind, 
just make sure your lease language is professional. Make sure that you're requiring full compliance with licensure and regulations. Make sure that you're checking up on the operation. Make sure that they're not doing anything that's black market or illegal that's not part of what they're permitted to do. Every commercial lease has a permitted use clause. Mm. You have to have a robust set of language for your permitted use clause, and you have to know what your tenant's up to. I don't want to rent my cannabis space out to a cannabis operator and know that they're also running a morgue, right? right? I mean, yeah. that, that's just not the permitted use. Not because it's not permitted by the state or the city, which it probably wouldn't be anyway in this yeah. weird case, because I used morgue that's as an right. example, but because it's not part of the agreement that's in our lease with property owner and tenant. You can run your business according to the terms of the lease. The lease dictates everything. If the lease says you can run a cannabis retail operation and you're licensed for that, and you have the permits for that, and we agree, and you pay money, and as a deposit, and we sign a lease, God bless, you're off to the races. Let's go. If you have a cannabis slash morgue somewhere running, please reach out to us. We want to hear from you. <laughs> it can always be worse. It's something you said. Sure can. You, you, you said many times. I mean, it's, the, it's about to be. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the thing. We're getting a lot of doom and gloom in the headlines right now. Yeah. And when we talked about this originally, it's really, that's a quote from your mother, you said, that's really not about doom and gloom. And I wouldn't want you to touch on that about like, why, it's not why, about doom yeah, and why gloom. is that not a sad concept? It means shut up, stop complaining. You're so lucky that you're still alive and breathing and you have a heartbeat. So whatever it is that's making you whine like a little bitch, stop it, pull your big boy panties up and get to work mm. and be grateful for what you have. Express gratitude. If you have health, you have hope and get out there and go get some stuff done. Yeah. It can always be worse. Thank God it's not. Yeah. That's what it means. Outsized gratitude. I love that. Yeah. All right. And work yourself out of a job is another one uh, that I've heard you say many times. And I love that. That's one of my favorites. Well, you're probably bringing that up because it's uh, not the best labor environment to start doing Yeah, that. right now, I think a lot of people are really grasping tightly to their jobs. Uh, Listen, and, you know, I don't so. mean it literally, yeah. figuratively, right? Well, sort of, a little bit of both. But mm -hmm. I want you to be so good at your job that you're creating so much value for your organization and that you've set up systems and you're so efficient, you're such a good manager and you're generating such quality output that things sort of happen automatically. Mm. So when I say work yourself out of a job, get to the point where the critical functions that need to happen for your job, role, or department to succeed happen. They happen automatically, whether you're there or not. The best people at the best of their craft, they can accomplish this. And Believe me, you won't get fired because you've done such a good job that you don't need to be there. You're going to get promoted. You're going to get moved around. You're going to get bonused, raised, all of that stuff. So if you can work your way out of a job, so to speak, it's the surest way to make sure that you're on a trajectory to get promoted, to get more money, get a different department, get a different title, whatever. But it's only going to be good for you. You're not going to get canned. You're not going to get fired. If you're doing such a great job, they're going to keep you. That's the point. Well, and this really focuses on, again, value rather than I think so many people equate busyness with productivity and it is not the same thing. And so that if you can get to a point where it's not you're, the same you're less busy but delivering the same amount of value, well, now all of a sudden you have all this time to deliver more value um, with that time. That or you teach have, others so. how to do it. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's what I got, Peter. I don't want to rush off. Now that I rushed in, I don't want to rush off. Uh, do you have anything else you want to I have nothing on? else. Or, fantastic. I thank you. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Thanks so Adios, much. Adios, George. Have Thanks. Have If you like what you just heard, you can subscribe to The Daily Cash Flow on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'd love it if you left us a comment or review. You can follow us on TikTok and Twitter at SiegelCap, and on Instagram at Siegel.Cap. As always, if you're an accredited investor, go to SiegelCapital.com and take our survey to see if you qualify to take part in one of our apartment building deals. That's S-I-E-G-E-L Capital.com.